Well, a lot of you were here a year or so ago when I first came out here from Channel 10 to, uh, to meet you guys and do a story on this amazing church. And um, this was the result of that story. Yeah. Lord, that I think 
uh, has touched my heart and one that you've laid on my heart. Lord, I thank you so much for faith like a Ferrari. May we all have it and ask that in your name. Amen. 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 That is my son's favorite Bible story. The least in Hungary. That's your favorite story, right? Yeah. We have this little Bible, this little five-minute story Bible at home. You know, it's, you flip through the pages and it takes you know, a couple minutes to read each one. There's pictures and that one he loves. Every time we ask to read a story, he flips to this one. Hey, read this one. I, I don't know if it's because of Jesus or if it's because someone ripped open a roof. I think it's the destruction that he likes. <laughs> um, but even he likes that story. So we, we read this quite a bit. But this week I actually read through it a little bit more. And I thought about it because of an experience that I had a couple of months ago. Uh, if you remember Hurricane Matthew came through the Gulf of Mexico. Gosh, when was that? You know, six months ago, something like that. Maybe longer, eight months ago. <coughs> And uh, at the TV station, we're required to kind of be all hands on deck type of things. When you, know, you work at any TV station or any news outlet, they basically send everybody out in the rain. And um, you know, they say, take a camera, don't let the camera get wet, and do some incredible things. You know, it's kind of a silly ask to get us to go out into you know, the, uh, the storm and interview people who shouldn't be there. They should be doing other things. Um, but they ask us to, um, to go out and do these stories. And, um, so I actually have to have been doing an interview that was unrelated to the hurricane. I, I needed to go meet uh, a woman who lived in Newport Ritchie. Now Newport Ritchie's got these like fingers that jet out into the water uh, in different parts of the land. It extends out into, into the Gulf there. And so she happened to live right on the end of one of these fingers. And so I was doing an interview with a family who had a stilt house. If you've ever seen them, there's these houses that pop up out of the water. They're built on stilts, these big poles that are driven down into the, the ground and the poles kind of elevate the house off the water. And I didn't really know much about these before, but I learned a whole lot about them in, in the process of doing a TV story about it. A lightning bolt came down, hit this person's house, and it burned up. It totally charred because the wood out there gets so dry because it's getting baked in the sun all day that as soon as it gets hit, it's, it's toast. And this poor guy's uh, you know, still house burned down. And the woman who sits right on the end of the finger watched it. She was about a quarter mile from the house on the edge of her uh, property there sat on the back porch and just watched it burn. She happened to know the family, and so she called them, and they all came out, and they just sat there and watched their house burn, which is a very sad story. But in order to retell the story, which ended up being nice, they rebuilt their house with the community help, and it was a lot of uh, really neat things that happened to them. In order to rebuild the house, we had to go back to the beginning and talk to the woman about what it was like to watch it burn down. And so I called this woman right around the time the hurricane was coming by, and I said, Patty, I need to come to your home. You know, we kind of planned on coming by in the morning. Uh, can we come by, you know, at 10 o'clock, something like that? And she said, oh, no, no, I can't do it now. i got to wait till the afternoon. So well, we kind of planned on the morning. That's how I was figuring out my day and doing interviews. Well, why can't we do it this morning? And she said, I have to move my car collection. And I thought, I don't know anybody with a car collection. He's got a matchbox, but I don't know anybody with a car collection. And she said, well, you know, we live right on the edge of the water, and so if the storm surge from this hurricane gets up over our backyard, it could get into the garage and it could mess up my cars. And I said, well, well how, what, you, what kind of car collection do you have? And she said, I have 13 Ferraris. <laughs> and I said, well, by all means, you move your car. <laughs> yeah, it was a $4 million Ferrari collection. Uh, she and her husband own an uh, exotic car dealership, and so over the years they collect these cars. And I said, "Well, Patty, I totally get it. Like, I, you know, my interview can wait. I don't want to jeopardize your elaborate car collection." Did you volunteer to help move the Ferrari? She asked me to. Oh, help move yeah. the oh sorry. She I called me and said, "You want to wanna help?" <laughs> <laughs> well, I was coming up this morning anyway, so, <laughs> so I, I drove up to Newport Ritchie pretty quickly. <laughs> and, uh, so we got to this lady's house, and um, and sure enough, she has this enormous home that I mean I've, I've never really been in a home this big before. She knocked out the bottom floor, like there are no pillars or anything in the bottom floor of her home. So this two or three story house, the entire bottom floor is a garage for her car. So she keeps them all in the bottom of her home. I was like, this is amazing. This is fantastic. <laughs> And right. she's like, oh, would you like to see the cars? And I'm like, yeah, yeah. I get <laughs> Let's check them out. So she's taking me through her garage. She had all these different kinds of cars and beautiful colors. I'm not, I, I could not fix a car if I had to. I mean, I can fix a tire and change a tire. There's about nothing else I can do except add washer fluid and gas to a car. I, I can't fix anything. So I know nothing about cars. 
but I know what I like to look at, and these were fun to look at. And she had 13 beautiful, beautiful cars, uh, all different ages. She had the one from the Magnum PI show back in the day. Yeah. She had some brand new racing for one of uh, one of her cars was one of 500 edition that had ever been made. Uh, just unbelievable. Now, if you own an exotic car dealership, you, you probably get to see a lot of these different things. But um, she just had this collection. She and her husband really enjoyed them, and they were investments for them. And, uh, Great for them, you know. Um, so we basically spent two hours a day moving Ferrari around town. And uh, I didn't, unfortunately didn't get to drive one. She said I could if I wanted to, but I thought, if I crash this poor woman's car, <laughs> it's worth more than this building, like one car. It's, it's, I mean, I, I didn't think it was a good idea. To, You'd be on your own TV station. I, <laughs> it was, it was rough. Yeah, um, I didn't think it was a great idea to drive her cars, um, but I did ride in two of them. And it was very cool. Um, it kind of felt like, you know, if, if you've ever been on a roller coaster before, you've gotten to the top of a roller coaster and it kind of goes down and you get that, your stomach comes up in your throat. That's every green light. It's amazing. <laughs> I mean, these things are like rockets with wheels. And um, we, would, we drove around uh, for probably two or three hours just moving the cars to a, a hangar, an airport hangar that is nearby that could protect the cars from rain and things. And, um, it was pretty, pretty remarkable. Um, I, I, I can't say that it's ever happened before, and I don't know that it's ever going to happen again. But it was, it was pretty cool to spend the afternoon uh, moving Ferraris all over town. Um, but it got me thinking about Ferraris from that point on. And um, you know, I, I, I've never really been around them. I never really knew much about them. So I did some research on what Ferraris are, and I actually found that Ferraris, a lot of the traits that you can look at for these exotic cars, really correlate to faith in many ways. Um, to me, if you look at Ferraris. They have a couple different traits. One of them is they don't advertise. And I thought that was very odd. You know, most car dealers advertise. You know, the Super Bowl was a couple of weeks ago. Um, I, I think there were eight different car companies that ran a commercial in the Super Bowl. A 30 second commercial in the Super Bowl cost $5.25 million. And all eight ran a 60 second commercial. So they spent at least $10 million on one minute of television to advertise Ford or Kia or whatever brand or Hyundai, whatever type of car dealer was. They spent a lot of money. Ferrari doesn't do that. They don't advertise at all, which is very odd uh, to me that they don't do that. Um, five and a half million dollars for 30 seconds of TV, that's, that's a considerable chunk of some company's budget that they would dedicate to one football game, and a lot of companies do that. It's very odd to me that Ferraris do not advertise. Uh, obviously, Ferraris are powerful. Um, I actually looked it up. They make a car, it's called the 812 Superfast, it's a 6.5 liter V12 engine, 0 to 60 in 2.9 seconds, 789 horsepower. Oh, wow. um, yeah, the car I drive has 178 horsepower. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, that's how your stomach goes up. Uh, green light. Yeah, they're, they're obviously very, very powerful cars. Car. They're also very valuable. The two most expensive cars ever sold in the history of cars are Ferraris. In 2013, a 1963 Ferrari GTO sold for $52 million. And then last year, the same car sold for $70 million. One car. Um, so obviously, they're very valuable. You can just tell by looking at them that they're valuable. Uh, many, many of the Ferrari models that you could you know, see rolling down the street now are $300,000 cars. I mean, most people's homes don't cost $300,000, and that's one car. Uh, it's, it's pretty impressive how valuable they are. And what I learned from Patty when we went to talk to her about her collection is that Ferraris are one of the only sports cars whose value increases over time. Yeah. So they're investments for these uh, folks who own many of them like her. You know, if you were to go to buy a Maserati or a Lamborghini or any of these exotic fancy sports cars, you know, they're nice, but they depreciate in value very quickly. A Ferrari is one of the only ones that over time maintains and actually increases its value. Obviously, that 1963 car wasn't a $70 million car when it was first introduced, but over time, because of its rarity and because of how incredible the machine was, it went up in value. Most cars aren't going to go up that high, but they eventually will go up over time, so they're very valuable cars. Also, they're very attractive, perhaps you've noticed. They're really good looking cars. Um, People were waving at me when I was riding in the passenger seat. <laughs> and it wasn't because I was attracted, it was because the car was attracted. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're, uh, they're very sleek, they're very modern. You're a pretty good looking guy. Well, not as good as the car. The car, ooh, I know. I'm like a seven, the car's a pretty good guy. Um, the, the company called Autocar, uh, you know, it, it 
has a website that ranks cars and talks about different car parts. I looked it up this week. AutoCar does car reviews, and in 2017, they named the 20 most beautiful cars ever made, and six of the 20 were Ferraris. So we know that they're an attractive car. We know people look at them as they drive by. They, you know, we've gone to different car shows around town. Everyone seems to be huddled around the Ferraris. They're, they're really cool to look at. So they're attractive as well, but I think the most interesting part about Ferraris is they turn heads. Now, every red light that we came to when we were moving these cars, somebody next to us rolled down the window and said, what kind of car is that? And I'm like, it's a Camry. <laughs> <laughs> no, it wasn't Camry. Um, but every single person was yelling, that is so cool. One guy in this old truck tried to rev his engine, and that was funny. Um, <laughs> you know, just, they were laughing. And it, it, it's, it's really cool. They turn heads. I saw one the other day when I was driving around for work. And uh, I did one of these. It's not safe, but I, you know, <laughs> they're just such an attractive car. They, they naturally turn your head. Um, You've I, done that before. I've done that before. <laughs> <laughs> Ferrari makes $1.5 billion a year on merchandise. Wow. Hats and glasses and jackets and shirts and things. So the, the people that like Ferraris want you to know they like Ferraris. <laughs> you know, uh, I think that's incredible that they make that much money on just the thing that you can wear and the thing that you can kind of tag along to, to make you uh, aware of the fact that Ferraris are cool. And it got me thinking, what if we had the same passion about our faith as we do about these cars? Yeah. Like I just spent 10, 20 minutes talking about a car. And we're like, oh man, that's so cool. Ferrari's so cool. When's the last time you had that reaction about your faith? It, it just doesn't seem to come up as often in conversation. So I want to read this story one more time, this story about Jesus and the paralyzed man. Because I think a lot of these traits that refer to Ferraris can relate to our faith if we're willing to have faith like a Ferrari. So I'm going to read Luke again. Luke 5, 17 to 26. One day Jesus was teaching. The Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there. They had come from every village of Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal the sick. Now some men came carrying a paralyzed man on a mat. And they tried to take him into the house to lay him before Jesus. Now... Other accounts of this will tell you some of the details that are left out in Luke's account. This house was actually Peter's house, one of Jesus' 12 disciples. Peter had this house. It was in Capernaum. This had just happened after Jesus walked through a graveyard and healed a man who had a bunch of demons inside him. Legion was the nickname of the Legion, or the demons. Many, many demons. This man, and Jesus cast them out, went into the pigs, and ran down the hill. This, this is a very small home, a wooden block home. It's a square with like a thatched roof on the top. This was Peter's house, and so this was a place that Jesus felt safe, but people had followed him to this tiny little home. And so when the people came carrying the paralyzed man on the mat, they couldn't get in. This was, this was a very small building. Homes back then were not very large. They weren't, you know, 1,500, 2,500 square feet like a lot of homes are in here. They were very small homes. So the crowd was so large that the man carrying the, the paralyzed man on the mat couldn't get in the door. There was just no path to Jesus. And so what they did is they went up on the roof, lowered him on his mat, threw the tiles of the middle of the crowd right in front of Jesus. They ripped a hole in the roof, which is made of mud and straw and palm fronds and things like that, that over time in the sun had baked and become hard. They basically tore a hole in it and dropped Jesus, or dropped the man's foot down to Jesus. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said, friend, your sins are forgiven. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law began thinking to themselves, who is this fellow who speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? And Jesus knew what they were thinking, and he asked, Why are you thinking these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or get up and walk? But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, and take your mat, and go home. And immediately he stood up in front of them, took what he had been lying on, went home, praising God. Everyone was amazed and gave praise to God. They were filled with awe and said, We have seen remarkable things today. In Mark's uh, gospel, the last verse says, We have never seen anything like this. So this was a big deal that Jesus would do this for a paralyzed man. Those same traits that I mentioned about the Ferrari earlier can relate to your faith if you want to have faith like a Ferrari. Now, if you want to have faith like a Camry, Camry's fine. I'll get you A to B. But I think if we were to ask you, describe your faith in a car, you would want someone to describe it in a way that was high-powered and valuable and incredible and turned heads. You want someone to describe you and your faith as a Ferrari, not necessarily as a camera. 
you know, offense to anyone who likes tankers. Um, but I think that what's interesting about Ferraris and Faith is that they coincide in some of these traits. You know, Faith, you shouldn't have to advertise your Faith. Just like Ferrari doesn't spend all the money on Super Bowl commercials, you, you shouldn't have to go out and publicly tell people, hey, hey, I'm a Christian, I love God. You shouldn't have to do that. Your actions should actually speak for what you are. And so we go to verse 18 to look at this. It says right here in the first verse, some men, some men came carrying a paralyzed man. It doesn't say special men. It doesn't say wealthy men. It doesn't say interesting men. It just says some men, regular old people, came carrying this man on the mat. Not fancy men, not rich men. It's interesting. I went through and read it. It doesn't even say that they know the man who's on the paralyzed mat. I think a lot of times we've gotten this wrong over the years, and I think even our little Bible that we read with him in the five minutes says they picked up their friend. I went back and read all three accounts. It doesn't say anywhere that these men knew the person who was paralyzed. It could have been the case that they were just coming to see Jesus, and they happened to see a paralyzed man. Maybe they were a friend. We really don't know if they knew the paralyzed man, if he was a stranger, if it was someone who was crying for help. We don't know much about the paralyzed man except that he was in between these friends, these people, and Jesus. We also kind of assume there were four of them because there's four corners of a mat, and it says they carried them on the four corners, but we actually read later on that there were probably quite a few people that were in the crowd, and only four of them happened to be the people physically carrying the man to Jesus. And so it's interesting. They may not have even known the guy. Yeah, I think the guy being carried, the paralyzed man, looked up and said, I wonder if these guys love Jesus. I, I, I think they probably knew just by the actions. They didn't have to carry the paralyzed man and say, you know what, we love God. And you're going to see Jesus. I think this is going to be a good day for you. But you didn't have to do that. Their actions told their heart. It was a giveaway. And I think that just like Ferrari doesn't need to advertise for you to know it's an awesome car, you don't need to advertise to people that you're a Christian for them to see the fruits of your life and to see the things that you're doing that make a difference in the lives of others. And it's great if you do, but you shouldn't have to. I think the things that we do and the way that we live and the things that we say that should carry weight with people. Ferraris sound different than Camrys. You should sound different than someone who doesn't know God. That's the way that your body and the way that your mind and the way that your soul is supposed to operate. You're supposed to operate differently on another level. When God is living in your heart, your heart operates differently. There's a different engine in a Ferrari than there is in a Camry. You're supposed to operate differently, and I think it's obvious to people when we start acting like Christians that we are Christians. Unless you're a really good actor, I think people are going to be able to tell that things are different with you. You shouldn't have to advertise your faith. Your faith can be powerful, too. And we go to verse 20 here, and I thought this was really interesting. Verse 20 says, when Jesus saw their faith, he said, friend, your sins are forgiven. He's not talking about everyone in the picture. Jesus saw their faith. The guys up on the roof who had just cut a hole and lowered a man down onto the floor. When he saw their faith, he looked at him and said, your sins are forgiven. Now, I'm not saying that these people and their decisions can change the salvation of the person on the floor. That's not what it's saying here. But what it's saying is that when you see their faith, that helps save a man. You know, this person still has to make a decision. If you are out in the, in the community and you see a friend who needs some help and you're trying to get them towards Jesus, you're not saving them, but you're getting them to the guy who can save them. You yourself are not responsible for anyone else's salvation, but it's our responsibility as someone who is not advertising their life as a Christian, but has powerful faith to get someone to the doorstep of who can change their heart. And I think that's an important distinction. You know, the Message Bible, the Message Translation says about verse 20, Jesus was impressed by their bold belief. There's a footnote in my Bible here that says, it wasn't the paralyzed man's faith that impressed Jesus, but the faith of the friends. So Jesus responded to their faith and healed the man, for better or worse. Our faith affects others. We cannot make another person a Christian, but we can do much through our own words, actions, and love to give him or her a chance to respond. So we need to look for opportunities to bring our friends to the living Christ. That's exactly what these guys did. They picked up a man who had a problem. He was stuck. He couldn't move. We don't know if he was born that way. We don't know if he had an accident. We have no idea how he became paralyzed, but he was stuck. And these people came along and picked him up and said, I know who can get you unstuck. And when they got to the house, even though they saw a problem, they said, we're going to get around this problem by going on the roof. We're not going to let this stop us. They took the man on the roof, lowered him down, and their faith, their powerful faith, got this person healed. 
So Ferraris don't have to advertise. Ferraris are powerful, and Ferraris have value, but so does your faith. Your faith is incredibly valuable. You know, if we read in verse 24. But I want you to know, this is Jesus speaking, I want you to know the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sin. So he said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. Healing only happened to the man who had been paralyzed after he was at the feet of Jesus. Now, Jesus, we know, can heal from anywhere. You know, if, if you read through the, the Bible, you'll find there's stories of Jesus healing people with just a word who are miles and miles away. We hear people of Jesus, who go, or stories of people who actually encounter Jesus. They touch the hem of his garment, and they're healed. Jesus goes in and touches people, and they're healed. He doesn't have to be in your space to heal you, but more often than not, that's the way it happens. And so we don't know what happened to this guy. We don't know exactly how he, uh, he ended up getting paralyzed, but nobody ended up getting a miracle in the Bible without having incredible faith. Nobody had a miracle. I mean, you can read through any book, anywhere, any uh, the Old Testament, New Testament, it doesn't matter. Nobody ends up finding a miracle unless they are having incredible faith. Jesus doesn't go through and take care of you unless you have a faith in his heart. Now, he's going to come into your home. He's going to take care of, uh, he's going to come into your heart if you, uh, if you invite him in. But Jesus doesn't come through and, uh, and take care of people who don't come in and take care of themselves through faith, which I thought was pretty impressive. But your faith is incredibly valuable. How valuable is it? Well, there's 12 disciples in the Bible, and 11, and 11 of them died a martyr's death. I thought that was uh, interesting. John is the only one who lives his entire life and doesn't die a horribly painful death. Um, Thomas was speared. Um, Paul was beheaded. Peter was crucified upside down. You don't go through that unless you have something incredibly important to you that's in your heart. A faith that's so valuable that you would die a death that way. Why would these people die a death for something that wasn't valuable? A death so painful. They didn't die for something that wasn't worth dying for. So Ferraris obviously have all these different categories that fit to faith, and I think faith shares this trait with Ferraris. Your faith is attractive. I think Ferraris are obviously very attractive, but I think faith is attractive too. If you go to verse 25, it says, Immediately, he stood up in front of them, took what he had been lying on, and went home praising God. And everyone was amazed and gave praise to God. Everyone was amazed. This was a huge, huge, huge crowd. Enough that you couldn't get through the door. You couldn't even get through the windows. There were people hanging out of the windows, people trying to jam into the doors because they knew Jesus was in this tiny little room. There's keeping people on the roof now. I'm sure there's others that realize there was guys on the roof, and now they're peeking down the hole just to get a glimpse of Jesus. The faith was attractive. Everybody watched. So we live in a world where faith is not necessarily celebrated anymore. Science has scoffed at. Biology is a suggestion for a lot of folks. I'm here to tell you that that is a very tough show. Inside, that people are dying to have faith just like yours. If you're living the right way, if you have faith like a Ferrari, if you have unbelievable faith that your actions are showing others that you are doing things God's way, that becomes attractive to people. Even if on the outside they say, oh, we don't really like that, we don't really like the way that you live, we don't think that we need to be that way, just leave us alone, we're going to do whatever we feel like. At some point, everyone comes around to the point that they understand that God cares for them and that God loves them, your faith is extremely attractive. Even in, the, even in those short interactions with people that may not seem attractive, deep down it is. People want to have some kind of connection to God. And if you have the opportunity to share it with people, that becomes more and more and more attractive. You don't become more attractive, just like that. Again, I wasn't all that attractive in the car, but the car is attractive. <laughs> that faith is attractive. People want to have a genuine relationship with God. They just sometimes don't understand how to get in the house. But lastly, truth, true faith turns heads. Just like that car turned heads when I was driving down the road. Verse 26, I love the end here. Everyone was amazed and gave praise to God, and they were filled with awe. And they said, we've seen remarkable things today. See, when you have faith like a Ferrari, it, it outperforms regular old faith. That 812 super fast I was talking about goes 0 to 60 in 2.9 seconds. Our car goes 2.9 years to get to 60. <laughs> it's different, you know. Your faith may work if you have camera faith, but does it work as well? It's important to have any kind of faith, but I think that having faith like a Ferrari gets you where you need to go faster. It gets you to God faster. True faith is powerful, it's valuable, it's attractive, it turns heads if you're doing it right. That's because Jesus turned heads. 
Jesus turned enough heads that people left where they were going and they wanted to get to him. So for you today, do you have faith like a Ferrari? Or do you have faith like a Camry? Does your faith sputter? Or does it roar? Does your faith turn heads or do you kind of blend in with the crowd? Do people look at you as you're different? Or do they look at you just like everybody else? Do you stand out? If it's not obvious, it's not effective. I think our faith should resemble more Ferrari than it does him. Any kind of faith is good. It'll get you A to B. This will get you where you need to go, but this will get you there way faster. So I don't think it's important for me to come in here and just give you a lecture and say, hey, well, these are nice bullet points and this matches this, but there's no solution. And I don't really think that church is a place where you go to get motivational speeches. You know, there's plenty of places you can go for a motivational speech that has nothing to do with God. If God's in the equation, there should be more than just a motivational factor to it. To where you go outside and reality hits you on Monday and you totally forget that motivational feeling that you had on Sunday. That doesn't make any sense. To me, if you're coming in, you need to figure out a way in church to upgrade your life. Just like when you come into a Ferrari, you're upgrading your wheels. You know, you can you can drive your Camry around and it's great. But I think everyone wants to upgrade. Life alert. My wife is having a baby here. Very soft. But in doing so, we need to upgrade a car because we can't fit three car seats in the back of the car that we have right now. They just don't make them like that. That doesn't work. Um, and so we're trying to figure out if we can afford to get a bigger car um, because we need to upgrade. Our life is upgraded, and so we need to upgrade our mode of transportation. I think when you, you go check out how to upgrade your faith, yeah. you have to go back to verse 17. And I love it. The very first thing we hear in verse 17 is one day. This wasn't a special day. This wasn't a holiday. This was just one day. One day Jesus happened to be here, which means he'll meet you in the old day. You can upgrade your faith today. You can upgrade your faith tomorrow. You can upgrade your faith any moment you feel ready. One day, Jesus showed up. And they showed up to see Jesus from every village of Galilee, Judea, and Jerusalem. Jerusalem and Capernaum are 85 miles apart. Are you willing to walk 85 miles to see Jesus? Because these people were 85 miles. Even if you feel far away from Jesus today, if you feel like this camera faith is kind of getting you somewhere, but it's not quite getting you where you need to go. Are you willing to upgrade your life to Ferrari faith to get you to Jesus faster? Ferrari takes about five seconds to get 85 miles, I'm pretty sure. We can get there pretty quick. 85 miles is nothing to a Ferrari. If you feel far away, you're not alone. There's a lot of people who came from 85 miles away to see Jesus in this tiny little room. They just wanted to get a glimpse of him. If you want to upgrade your faith, you got to come to Jesus. Because as it said here, the power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal the sick. The power of the Lord was with Jesus that day. They came from 85 miles away just to see the power of the Lord at work. But what I thought was interesting is that Jesus didn't heal the paralyzed man first. The first thing he said here was, when he saw their faith, friends of the root, when we see your faith, friend, your sins are forgiven. So he healed the man's sin before he healed the man's situation. And I think a lot of the times we want it the other way around. So we see our situation, but God heals our soul. God's working on your soul, perhaps, before he's working on your situation. Or even more so, he's working on your situation through your soul. I think a lot of the times we show up and we feel like the paralyzed man. Yeah, we got to the feet of Jesus, and now Jesus, give me my legs back. I, I want to walk today. And Jesus says, that's not the most important thing today. The most important thing today is that your soul gets fixed. I think a lot of times we want things out of order. Maybe God's working on your soul today. Or maybe he's working on your legs today. Maybe he's working on you because maybe you have more of a Pharisee's heart in the crowd. A judging heart who doesn't understand why this Ferrari faith and the man on the mat and the man on the roof would do such incredible things to get close to Jesus. But I want my faith to be described as a Ferrari. If, if people see me at work, or they see me walking through the grocery store, or they see me around town, they see me in this building, I don't want them to look at me and say, eh, you might look odd. 
I, I want him to look at me and say, man, that guy looks different. It just sounds different. Just like a Ferrari sounds different when you're driving down the road. When they turned this Ferrari on, when Patty turned the Ferrari on the garage, I stepped back a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> kind of scary a little bit, but sometimes Ferrari faith can be a little scary. Because you got to let go. When we get to the red light, and the, the gentleman who was driving the car, Patty's brother, he floored it, and we fishtailed a little bit. That was a little scary, because I'd never been in a car that had fishtailed before. <laughs> it just doesn't happen in the old kid. It doesn't happen in the old kid. Um, sometimes, when you upgrade your faith, things get a little scary, because you understand that it's a powerful thing. But faith like a Ferrari is powerful, it's attractive, it's valuable, and it turns heads. I hope that you have an opportunity to upgrade your faith in Ferraris today. Patty's got a Ferrari collection has grown. It's, she now has 14 Ferraris. Uh, checked in on her. She, she added another, uh, you know, horse to the barn. Um, and when I heard that, I said, wow, that's pretty cool. And I immediately went back to the faith conversation. Said, Damn, do people talk about the faith? I just added a, you know, we're adding another child. Oh, it's not upgrading, upgrading your faith, it's upgrading your life. I hope we get as excited about our faith as we do about Ferraris. Do people marvel at your faith? Do they marvel at who you are? Do they marvel at what's going on? Even if your situation's not ideal, like you're paralyzed man, do you still put your faith and trust and hope in Jesus that your soul is worth more than your situation? I think it's important. I hope that today you embrace so let's pray real quick before we wrap up here. Father, we thank you so much for faith. We know that any kind of faith is a valuable faith, but we know that faith like a Ferrari is what we desire. We know, Lord, that uh, we're going to get to you someday, and we're going to have an opportunity to, to share with you all the wonderful things that you plan for us and all the things that you have for us. So we ask that you upgrade our faith today, that it be more like a Ferrari, that it be more fast-paced, more powerful, more attractive than ever before. Thank you for today and this place. Amen.